Hello and welcome to this, the first episode in JetBrains Java Developer Advocate's uh, too long, didn't read news summary of, uh, of what happened in the JVM and Java world for the last month or so. It is now November, more or less, probably by the time this video goes out, and um, I've just finished doing Java Annotated Monthly for November. This is my monthly newsletter, which summarizes a whole bunch of news. What I thought would be interesting is if we could do like a five minute version of this for the uh, too long, didn't read uh, the newsletter, and I'll give you five minute summary of what's kind of most relevant and interesting in the Java world. I'm Trisha G, and I'm the lead Java developer advocate at JetBrains. I tend to try and stay up to date on what's happening in the Java world. I also have lots of opinions on things, which is what makes me truly uh, qualified to do this news roundup. The first thing I want to cover is Java 16. So Java 15 came out in uh, September this year. We are now on six monthly releases. So Java 16 is due out in March, on March 16th, actually. So there's been a few pieces of news around what's expected in Java 16. For example, um, somehow along the line, I missed the fact that records and um, pattern matching for instance of, which were preview features in Java 15, will probably be standard features in Java 16. That's kind of interesting because records is one of my most favorite features of Java 15. Records is, of course, a way to get rid of a bunch of boilerplate in data classes. So you don't need getters, setters, you don't need constructors, you don't need hash code, two string, two string and equals. Um, and so it might not seem that exciting. We kind of get used to not looking at boilerplate code anyway. Our IDEs like IntelliJ IDEA can hide a bunch of it away. So maybe records shouldn't be that exciting, but really it just makes it a lot easier to just create small classes to contain data and can make our syntax a bit smaller in terms of when we use them and how we pair data together. So that's kind of coming in Java 16. Um, it's already available in Java 15 as a preview feature. Pattern matching for instance of that was also available as a preview feature. It hasn't changed for a few versions, I think, or not significantly. So um, that's kind of interesting to look at for Java 16. The other thing that's interesting from Java 16's point of view is if you want to play with Project Loom. Loom is lightweight threads on the JVM. And uh, this is kind of interesting from a high performance point of view. Now, this hasn't been scheduled for Java 16 yet, but you can download a preview. You can download a build of the JDK, which is a JDK 16 build, which includes Loom. So if you want to play with Loom, you can do that too. And um, the next thing which is in uh, JDK 16, or probably in JDK 16, is uh, the second preview for sealed types. Uh, sealed types, types is a really interesting way of, I've said interesting like 16 times. Uh, sealed types is a good way to control the hierarchy of your objects. Yeah, there's some ZGC additions as well. So the garbage collector is evolving over time over these different versions of Java. Speaking of garbage collectors, how's that for a segue? Um, I found a bunch of articles this month on um, Java performance, uh, specifically high performance and low latency. This is an area I'm particularly interested in because I used to work for a low latency finance trading platform in London back in the day. Um, so I've, I've been reading a bunch of stuff this month about why Java is a good choice for high performance code. It might seem counterintuitive, even though back in, I think 2011, um, the company I was working for, LMAX, was talking about how to do this uh, in the finance world. Um, even 10 years later on, people tend to think of uh, high performance code as being sort of C and C++. It's not necessarily the case. Uh, the JVM is a really good platform for this, partly because the JVM is extremely clever and can optimize a bunch of your code on the fly in the runtime. So you don't even need to write clever high performance code. You write nice, clean code, nice, uh, small methods that are understandable to the human being, which means that the JVM can understand them and to make optimizations on the fly. So Java is a, is a good language for getting um, a good high performance code uh, from the beginning. Also, the, the other interesting thing about Java, obviously, is there's a lot of Java programmers out there. So it's, it's a great language to choose for a bunch of applications because you can just hire a bunch of Java programmers and get them working your application straight away. So I've been seeing a few articles about why choose Java for high performance, and, and that's kind of the summary of that. But it did remind me of the work we were doing at LMAX. So I, I just want to give a bit of a plug to LMAX and the Disruptor. So LMAX, where I was working in London, we were relying on the JVM to do a bunch of optimizations, but we also created our own open source project called the Disruptor, which was a very fast mechanism to pass data between threads. The other, the other topic, since we came here from garbage collectors, high performance Java, how does garbage collection impact that? Well, in modern Java, you've got a range of garbage collectors to choose from, even in the even in OpenJDK, but also different vendors have different garbage collectors and, and so forth. So they have different profiles. 
And I think the interesting thing about this is that no longer do you have to set a bunch of magic flags to get your garbage collector to do what you want. You can just pick the right garbage collector for your profile, which may or may not work for your low latency, high performance uh, application. There's um, some articles in um, Java Annotated Monthly this month, which talk about how to make the decisions around creating your high performance application, how to decide whether your application needs to be high, high performance and, and how to measure that sort of thing as well. I mentioned the LMAX Disruptor. One of the interesting things about the LMAX Disruptor is that it is open source, which leads me on nicely to my next topic for this, uh, which is open source. So we've just had, we've just had October, JetBrains sponsored Hacktoberfest, Hacktoberfest, I've always thought, is a, is a great idea to get people passionate and interested in, in contributing to open source. However, there was a little bit of controversy this month around the sponsoring of Hacktoberfest and how the how it puts quite a lot of pressure on open source maintainers to uh, effectively gatekeep against uh, um, not so great pull request submissions. And it puts a lot of a lot of burden on those. What I found uh, a cool about this in the end is that uh, the company behind Hacktoberfest responded to this and made some changes accordingly. Also, I believe GitHub made some changes too. So it is important to uh, raise issues when you see that things are, are not working for the community the way you want them to, because organizations, the ones that are trying to do the right things, they will make changes to um, try and drive things in the right direction. You just try and assume that people are doing things for the right reason and not just trying to mess up the community. Uh, I personally found Hacktoberfest quite inspirational. Uh, firstly, I was on a panel for JetBrains Advocates where we, we talked about open source for fun and profit, which I could get to share some of the stories about the disruptor, which is what I was just talking about, and how open source can make you profit as an individual and how it can help your organization to be profitable or better or whatever. Uh, that was a really interesting panel. Um, and I found the whole thing kind of inspirational in terms of it made me remember why I like coding, why open source is important. And I even managed to get a couple of uh, pull requests submitted into a bunch of um, uh, projects where I haven't done that for absolutely ages. So uh, I thought on balance, Hacktoberfest was quite a, a good positive influence on the community in terms of getting people thinking, what can I do? How can I give back to the community? How can I use my coding for good? Finally, I want to talk about conferences. Well, a conference in particular. I am a developer advocate, so I spend a lot of time speaking at conferences, not in 2020. Obviously, I spend a lot of time sitting at my computer speaking into the computer, which is not the same thing. However, this week we had JDConf, which was actually a conference by Microsoft, Microsoft Microsoft's first Java conference in a long time. Um, and this was super inspirational. I love the fact there were lots of people talking about modern Java. We were talking about some of the features in, in, Java, in JDK 15, for example, records, pattern matching, for instance of sealed types. There was a bunch of uh, really well-known speakers doing uh, those sorts of presentations. Um, I thought the atmosphere was quite friendly. It's difficult to get an atmosphere from a virtual conference, but the fact that there was a handover from a host, a bit of a conversation between you and the previous speaker, handover to the next speaker, that was kind of nice. It was fun. It made me feel a bit like I was at an actual conference. The most interesting thing about this conference was the keynote on day three, which was by my colleague Mala Gupta. It was about how the community had influenced her personally and professionally. And I found this super inspirational. It reminded me why I do this sort of thing, why I'm involved with user groups, why I go to conferences, why I, um, how I can work remotely here in Spain, but still feel connected to a wider, bigger picture. And um, I highly recommend you have a look at that keynote because it just made me feel warm and fuzzy about everything. Um, I don't think I have anything else to cover this month. I think that's plenty for, for a TLDR. Uh, so I will sign off. Thanks for watching.